Can you imagine going from death to life? I mean, being dead and all of a sudden finding yourself alive. Can you imagine going from abject darkness into light? Can you imagine having all your sins forgiven? Can you imagine no longer being a son of disobedience? No longer being under the prince of the power of the air? Can you imagine living on earth and yet being seated in heaven? We'll talk about it today. Incredible to think about it, about moving from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the kingdom of God, of once being a son of disobedience, walking according to the lusts of your mind and the lusts of your heart, and now able to overcome all that of once being totally earthbound and now being blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It absolutely is staggering. And you think, what could accomplish that? What could accomplish that is only one thing, beloved, and that is the power of God. And this is what we want to look at as we continue looking at Paul's prayer for those in Ephesus. Now, as we look at this prayer, what you, I want to remind you of is I want to remind you of the background of the Ephesians. And so let's take a quick excursion to Acts chapter 19. Now in Acts chapter 18, Paul visits Ephesus for the first time. They want him to stay, but he can't. And he says, I'll be back if it's God's will. Well, it certainly was God's will. And it certainly was God's will because there was a lot of work a lot of work that had to be done in Ephesus because the warfare there was great. Let's look at it. In Acts chapter 19, it says that there were Jewish exorcists who went from place to place, who attempted to name over those who had evil spirits the name of Jesus. And the reason that they were doing that was because what they saw was they saw the power of the name of Jesus. They saw Paul casting out evil spirits in the name of of Jesus Christ. And so what they said, I mean, they were very cautious and they were saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. You know who I'm talking about is Jesus that Paul preaches. These weren't people that believed in Jesus. These were people that knew about evil spirits and were trying to help people. An exorcist is a person that casts out evil spirits. And it says seven sons of one Sceva, a chief Jewish, a Jewish chief priest were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And then this is what happened. It says, and the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on the sons of Sceva, this Jewish chief priest's sons. They leaped on him, and I mean, they wrecked havoc. It says they leaped on him and subdued all of them, overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. I mean, this is the power of the enemy. I don't know... If you have ever dealt with someone that has demonic spirits, I have. And I have seen those demonic spirits in that person rise up and, and rage at me and come at me and say, if I could. And see, that was the thing. They couldn't because greater was he that's in me than he that was in the world. And I knew the power of God. I knew the power of God, and, and Paul wants the people at Ephesus to know he's praying in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 in verses 15 to 23. We have his prayer. 
We're on that third thing that he is praying for, that third what is. He wants them to know what is the surpassing greatness of the power of God towards those who believe. And the reason the sons of Sceva had no power was because they were using the name of Jesus. They were going against the evil spirits, but they didn't believe in Jesus. And this is why they came away. This is why they came away. I mean, this is why they took off. This is why they were out of there naked and wounded. And it says, and this became known to all. I mean, you can imagine it became known. I mean, they didn't have television. They didn't have radio. They didn't have a printing press, but they had their mouths and they lived in a smaller community than in smaller cities than you and I live. And you know, it was the talk, the talk of Ephesus. I don't know if you've ever been to Ephesus, but every other year, We take a teaching tour, the precept team and I, the teaching team, and we take a teaching tour. We have the most marvelous time. People tell us after the first day, second day, third day, I've gotten my money. How can you do this? And the teaching that they get is incredible. Well, one of the places we go is to the ancient city of Ephesus and how I love walking through that city with them and how I love explaining to them the book of Ephesians, how I love standing in that great, great amphitheater where where Paul was and, and where they were shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians for hours and, and standing there and saying, great is the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, it's absolutely awesome. And it says, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus and fear fell upon all of them and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Now, once you know what Paul's prayer was for them in regard to knowing the surpassing greatness of his power. And once you read Ephesians 2, which we're going to look at, uh, what you see is you see why Paul wrote what he did. You know, I've written a book and it's called Lord is at Warfare, Teach Me to Stand. And it's everything that the Bible teaches about spiritual warfare. I mean, everything from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's a marvelous study, and God has used it mightily. And you know, one of the favorite books in the prisons where we work, we work in prisons throughout the United States and many places in the world. And what we do is we teach those people in there how to study the Bible for themselves, how to study it inductively, how to discover truth for yourselves. Well, everything that I write has that inductive flavor to it. And so Lord is at Warfare, Teach Me to Stand is actually a a Bible study. And you go through week after week. There are teaching tapes that go with it. But anyway, the prisoners absolutely love it. It's one of their favorite books because they learn how to have victory when they come to know Jesus Christ, even living many times in very difficult and very hopeless condition. But their hope is in Christ. And they learn about the surpassing greatness of his power towards those who believe. And so of all the epistles in the New Testament, and that's where the epistles are, but all the epistles, this book Ephesians is the epistle on warfare. It's the epistle on the church, but it's the epistle on warfare. Well, it says many also of those who had believed kept coming and confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practice magic brought their books together. Now, practicing magic is, is flirting with the underworld. And they began burning them in the sight of everyone, and they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Now what God wants and what he is expressing through Paul to the Ephesians is he wants the word of God to grow in them in wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him and and to do its mighty, mighty work. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Now in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 we come to the third What is? What is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? Now, I'm going to give you some Greek words, okay? And they're in your study guide. So you can go to the website and you can download the study guide absolutely free. And that study guide, you you get it by going to Precepts for Life. 
precepts4life.com, preceptsforlife.com, or pick up the phone. You can call our 800 number, 1-800-763-1990. That's 1-800-763-1990. You know how I remember the 763? Because I was born again July, which is the seventh month in 1963. So it's 1-800-763-1990. All right, now, just that side light that I wanted to give you. Verse 19, let's look at the word greatness. Now, that word greatness is hyperbalo, H-Y-P-E-R-B-A-L-L-O-N, hyperbalon, excuse me. And this is what it is. It is a greatness. Now, listen. It is a greatness that is so great that it takes us to another sphere. And you're going to see that other sphere. It seats us in heavenly places. It takes us from being earthbound to having the power of heaven. So what he's going to do, he is so awed with his power. And Paul is trying to express it so that you get every dimension of it. So what he uses is he strings together all these power words. And this is why I'm giving them to you. All right. Now, he says the surpassing greatness of his power. I told you about the word power. It is the word dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I. Yes, I know you think of dynamite. Well, dynamite is pretty powerful when you light the fuse. So the way I mark power doesn't mean dynamite, but the way that I mark dunamis, power, is I draw like a little uh, firecracker, and and then I put a a uh, fuse on it, and or a stick of dynamite is really not a firecracker, but a stick of dynamite, and I put a fuse on it, and I color it red. All right, now. He wants them to know the surpassing greatness, this, this greatness that is so great that it takes us to another sphere of his power, of his dunamis. Now, dunamis means this, a cup, this is so important. You got it? You ready? A capacity to perform. In other words, God is going to give you the capacity to perform, the capacity to use the strength of his might, the capacity to stand against the power of the enemy. You're not going to have to be like the sons of Sceva that come against the enemy and all of a sudden your clothes are off and you're bruised and battered and wounded and running. Oh, no, oh, no. You're going to see that when it comes to spiritual warfare, every child of God who really understands who they are and the surpassing greatness of his power, this capacity to perform is able to stand firm against everything that the enemy will throw at you. So he wants them to know the third, what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Now the word working is, I'll tell you when we come back right after this break. Inductive Bible study helps me discover truth for myself by getting me to open the Bible and by leading me through questions to the text, by showing me how focusing on a word can give me uh, a structure to give me an answer to how to deal with circumstances, how to understand what obedience means, or how to just um, live my life. I think the people who do inductive study, if they stand up and live it out, they will be desirable and people will come up to you and say, I want what you've got. Discover truth for yourself through the Precept Inductive Bible Study Method. Visit PreceptsForLife.com or call 1-800-763-1990. Welcome back, my friend. Let's look now 
at Ephesians chapter 1, at this greatness, at the surpassing greatness of his power, this operational power, this power that is working within us. I want us to look, I left you with this word working. Now watch what it is, E-N-E-R-G-E-I-A, energia. And so what he's saying is that this working is, is, is it's, this power is not something that sits here like that plant that is absolutely dormant. And it's dormant because I'm going to tell you a secret. It is, uh, it is artificial. Okay, it's dormant. There's nothing live about him, about him, about the plant. I named him him. But anyway, so there's nothing about that plant that is alive, but he's saying the working of his power, this power, this dunamis that God has given you and me in Christ Jesus that he wants us to know and understand about is a power, beloved, that is full of energy. It is a working power. It is an alive power. It is an organic power. It is a divine power. It is a supernatural power. It is the power of God. And you're going to see about that power in just a minute. But let's go because it's, he's going to demonstrate and he's going to tell you what it did. But first, we've got to get down all these Greek words. So it's an operational power. It says, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of of his might. Now, the strength of his might is K R A T O S. K R A T O S. And that word means that it is a power, this is so good, that overcomes resistance. You see, those sons of Sceva could not resist or they could not overcome those evil spirits because they didn't believe. And that's why they went away naked. That's why they went away wounded. And that's why they fled away and standing their ground. But when you and I believe, what we have is we have the operational power, the operational working of the strength of his might. So that strength is a strength that overcomes resistance. Isn't this good? I mean, doesn't it absolutely thrill you? It ought to thrill you. I mean, you, you, you think of strength, but, but once you get into the depth, and, and I'm not taking into the depth. I'm not a Greek scholar. I just know how to study Greek. All right. I know how to get the Greek. And uh, so you find this and you begin to savor each word. But now listen, it is the strength of your might. No, sorry. It is the strength of his might. And that word might is I-S-C-H-Y-S. -S. Let me spell it for you again. I-S-C-H-Y-S. Y S. And he uses, he's he's putting all these power words together so that you might get an idea of the greatness, the surpassing greatness of his power toward you. Now watch what he says. With the working of the strength of his might. Now, might there means inherent power. Inherent is something that's inside of you. And so what you and I have is he's saying, I'm praying that you will know the surpassing greatness of God's power, the power that is in God, the inherent power that is in God, listen carefully, is in you. Now, I mean, what a thing to pray for other people. I mean, this ought to become part of our practice and praying for ourselves and for our family and, and, and for our church, for this church that God loves, that we would know the three what is -es, that we would know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now, he's going to describe this power to you. It is the power, verse 20, which he, God, brought about, and once again, you have the word E-N-E-R-G, and this time it's spelled E-N-E-R-G-E-K-E-R. -E 
in. And what you have is you have this energy now again, which he brought this operational power, which he, God, brought about in Christ when? When he, God, raised him from the dead. Now, what is the gospel all about, beloved? Well, the gospel is all about the fact that Jesus Christ died on a cross. He died. He would have hung there for all eternity if he had not been made sin for you and me. So he was made sin for us. The wages of sin is death. So Jesus died because he became sin for us. Now, he died, he went into the grave, he was as dead as they come, he was in a state of death for three days and three nights, and then God, with his operational power, raised him from the dead, and then he seated him in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named in heaven and earth. This is what God has done. And this is what he is praying that those people will realize, appropriate, and live in the light of it. This is, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you might know what is the hope of his calling? What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saint? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? So it says that which he brought about in Christ, and you want to mark the in Christ again, when he, God, raised him, Jesus, from the dead. And many times when I'm marking dead or death, I simply take a black fine pen and I put a tombstone over it. All right. From the dead and seated him at his right hand. Now listen, here's that key repeated phrase in heavenly places. Now in heavenly places was used in chapter one, verse three. Now we see it used again and you're going to see it used again after that. So I just took a blue pen and what I did was I drew a cloud around in the heavenly places. And when I drew that cloud, then I colored it blue so I can spot every time that it's used. So Jesus is seated in the heavenly places far above all rule. I want you to get the all rule and authority. And there's that word power again. But now it's, it's lesser powers. Now it is the power that belongs to the prince of this world. And so I drew my stick of dynamite, but I colored it black. And dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So what you know is there's another age that follows this. And that other age is when Jesus Christ, everything's summed up in Jesus and what he is doing is he is ruling as king of kings. And it says, and he put all things in subjection under his feet, all things in subjection under his feet. It's like he came and, and, and just take your foot and put it on a coffee table and pretend that underneath it is every power and every authority. He has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now listen to what it says. And he gave him Jesus as head over all the church. Now, who is the church? And this is the first time he uses the word body, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It is so good. And we'll talk about it more in our next lesson. When we have new believers um, and we're overviewing the Bible, of course, we, we start in Genesis. As we go through the overview of the Bible, we we start talking about making lists. Um, so they're, they're having to read chapters throughout the Bible as we go that overview. And so they're, they're learning the inductive study method right there in the class uh, that we have, the group that we have. Um, and then we're always encouraging them to, to take that home with them, to, to learn that they have a relationship with God and he wants to communicate with them. And taking that time to observe the text and to make the lists, uh, to, the context is very heavily important uh, emphasized and what we're doing is and they, they just pick that up the, the believers pick that up and 
when they start experiencing God teaching them something, that's that's when the that's when it really sets. You know, it's like wow, God can teach me something, uh, and that's pretty exciting when you know that happens. Discover truth for yourself through the Precept Inductive Bible Study Method. Welcome back. No, I am not pretending to be the Statue of Liberty. And no, I am not changing a light bulb. I'm standing on a ladder because I want to make a point. I don't ever want you to forget this. I want you to remember, beloved, in the midst of all that's going on down on planet Earth, in the midst of the warfare of life, in the midst of dealing with the father of lies, the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience, in the midst of walking in a world that is controlled under God's permission by the prince of the power of the air so that the whole world lies in his power. I want you to remember you're not in his power. I want you to remember, blessed one, precious one, beloved of God, child of God, chosen before the foundation of the world, predestined to be adopted as a son, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to remember where you are seated. I want you to remember the exceeding greatness of his power towards you who believe. So anytime you are attacked by fear, anytime you are threatened by the enemy, what you have to remember is this, and it's 1 John, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And God wants you to remember and to know the exceeding, the surpassing greatness of his power toward you. So every time that you get in this warfare, every time you get in the conflict, every time you start to be afraid, every time the enemy whispers in your ear, just say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus is my head and I am part of his body. His body which fills all in all. Christ is in me. God the Father is in me. The Holy Spirit is in me me. And because all of those are in me, then I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now watch, far above all power and all authority and all might and all dominion and every name that's named in heaven and earth, they're all under the feet of Jesus. And if they're under the feet of Jesus, they're under my feet because I am bone of his bone and I am flesh of his flesh. I am part of the body of Jesus Christ. So precious one, I pray for you that you will know, that you will know what is the hope of his calling? What is the riches? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in you? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards you who believe? In the midst of the warfare, look up, stand firm, you're the victor seated in heavenly places. Thank you for watching today. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more precepts for life.